This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Forget the frustration of picking commerce platforms when you switch your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling wherever you sell. With Shopify, you'll harness the same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash tech. Have you ever wondered what it's like to bite into nerds' gummy clusters? They're fruity. They're tangy. They're gummy. And they're crunchy. Nerds Gummy Clusters, a union of fruity sweet gummy and tangy crunchy nerds. Unleash your senses. Shop now at nerdscandy.com. Hey everyone, it's Bob Pulver. In this episode, I'm joined by two great guests, Ainesh Ravi and Victoria Seikau from Wonder, a startup that combines human expertise with AI to provide market research solutions. Personally, I was a market researcher when ChatGPT was publicly released, and I worked in IBM's Market Intelligence Group many years ago, so I'm fascinated by this topic. Victoria, Ainesh, and I dive into the evolution of Wonder, the challenges and benefits of incorporating AI into their workflow, and the importance of human expertise in the research process. Our conversation explores the role of AI in the future of work, discussing adaptability, productivity enhancement, and how to navigate the changing landscape of AI and market research. I hope you find this discussion as interesting and insightful as I did. Thank you again for tuning in. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Elevate Your AIQ. I'm your host, Bob Pulver. With me today are two guests from an interesting startup called Wonder, Ainesh Ravi and Victoria Seikau. Thank you guys for being here. Excited to be here and be an interesting conversation today. I'm excited to get into it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, just uh, to kick us off, why don't uh, each of you just give a little bit about your background and, um, you know, how you got to wonder and, yeah, I'm just curious about the paths that each of you took. So Victoria, why don't you go first? Oh, sure. Um, so I'm Victoria Seiko running sort of growth go to market efforts specifically how do we get more people to know about wonder um now that the company has you know really seen a lot of great success with different types of clients across the board my journey to wonder was squarely through iNish. Um, we went to school together, actually. So a, a fun little product <laughs> growth partnership here. But my journey was through research, through the primary side. For the most part, I did consulting, um, worked at a few different companies, had a few you know different types of clients over the years, um, working with Worker 500 and then B2B SaaS companies but always found myself doing a ton of desk research and Googling and, you know, getting smart on my, either my clients or my industry. And so having stayed in touch with iNation over the years and hearing how Wonder evolved and developed, was well, shocked that there's no other solution out there to make this whole space much easier. Ironically, I started in April, 2023, when AI was really hitting the scene in terms of, you know, AI has been around, machine learning has been around, but in terms of incorporating this into your business model, so um, I you know, missed almost a decade of Wonder's existence, but a new version of Wonder was born around the time that I joined. So I'll, I'll pause there because Inesh led that transition, but also has been through all the evolutions before, and I'm sure we'll get into it, but that is how I arrived at Wonder. Excellent. Inesh? Awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know. I can't believe it's been about like 15 years or so, Victoria, since, <laughs> since we've known each other and developed this relationship. And I'm glad that you know it's, it's led to... Um, and led to where we are today. And yeah, like Victoria said, it wonder has been, uh, it's been a wild ride, right? There's been kind of grew up in sort of the marketplace time for startups, whenever everyone was sort of the Uber for X sort of company, whenever they're just trying to uh, build sort of these large marketplaces. And I think we always knew that technology and AI was going to be a big part of that piece. The question was much more when. Uh, so much that we even, you know, invested our, in, on our own side on the AI front until we realized, actually, wait, this is a losing battle. It's going to require a ton more capital to, to actually make this, uh, make this a reality. And hey, if other companies are going to pour billions of dollars into it, uh, we will certainly on the application side reap the reward. So the moment those models came out, uh, we were on it like white on rice. Uh, and that, that's what sort of led to, you know, definitely a lot of the, the journey, like Victoria mentioned, like this is sort of the new version 
of Wonder, which is heavily technologized. And it's been a journey, right? To take a company that was um, very much more so, sure, we had that technology focus, but at the end of the day, we're still incredibly human driven. Uh, and then taking that, that experience that we had from how do we actually do research well, and then translating that into AI. And I think that there's a lot of really cool stuff, especially now with chains and agents, especially that allow that institutional knowledge to be capitalized upon versus just making one, you know, open AI call and expecting it to come back with something that is, that's right. There's a lot more complexity that you can build into the system based on the institutional knowledge that, that I think we have. I'm just excited to keep building here. That's awesome. I, I feel like certainly I could have used more of these tools thinking back to my market intelligence days at, at IBM where we were sort of scrambling. I mean, it was around when people still started talking about, you know, big data and do we have the horsepower to, you know, analyze this data? Do we have the right data, you know, relationships through, you know, data aggregators and things like that to get at, you know, trustworthy information. And certainly we were starting to play around with some of the IBM Watson powered, you know, AI stuff and some of the advanced analytics, but one of the things I find interesting about what you guys are doing, first of all, because our future is, you know, humans plus AI, and you guys are making, you know, both and basically take the best of uh, both in a sense and, and putting those together to come up with this optimized sort of output for different clients. And so were you helping them figure out, okay, now that we know what large language models are, let's take a very close look at where their limitations are so that we know, because I imagine like what tasks or what portion is, was done by a human versus what was done by, you know, even advanced analytics before there was generative AI, you know, that balance may not always be consistent, right? I mean, it's going to take on more tasks. And I guess I'm curious if, if any of your experiences led you to some epiphany that said, you know, this is, this is the right approach. Yeah, I'd say you hit the nail on the head, right? It is a moving target. Uh, and I think the way that we've tackled it is more of a behavioral change in terms of how our company thinks about this versus like, a, this is like a prediction that we have. Uh, and for us, when I, when I say behavioral change, I think it like actually goes as deep as the organizational structure of the teams such that we actually now brought on a lot of our individual really amazing researchers onto what we call our innovation team to actually understand what the limitations are because they have the deep understanding of like what amazing research looks like, but they also now have played around with the technology and are playing around with the technology day in and day out, 40 hours plus a week, where that, um, that sort of allows us to kind of bridge that gap a little bit and help get over some of those components of fear, but also be extremely realistic with like, hey, it's just not there yet with these things. And we're not afraid of that, right? That's okay if AI isn't great at these things, but at least we know that there's a path forward for the AI to be really great at these things. Or on the human side, we build incredible processes such that our humans can be excellent at these things. Uh, so I think that's sort of how we've tackled it much more like organizationally, like how do we shift uh, what the team structures look like and how we actually look at really the evolving opportunity of AI, not AI at a fixed point in time. Yeah. The other interesting thing that the team thought through, and I say the team because I joined and I'm like, what, how is this going to change? Like we were totally human powered and now we're, you know, in this inflection point of evolving the offer just to add some tangibility because the, the mindset piece is obviously critical for bringing the talent along who made the business successful and who are still going to be a very big part of this human the loop solution. But then there's the process piece. And so I guess, you know, even using the consulting framework of people and, you know, processes and tools, we need to think about the actual process that we follow to take a client request all the way through to request delivered or, or results and research delivered. Um, and so when we thought about the knowledge assembly line and the steps that we took as humans, that was how very tangibly you break down all the, you know, micro steps of first you have to take in the request. Is there ways that we can automate that and accelerate that? Even in that step, we have built a different approach than a lot of what you experience in the LLMs where we're clarifying questions. We're having a dialogue with the submitter instead of just 
you know, I'm interested in a competitive landscape and GPT's off to the races. And you're like, wait, I didn't mean global. I meant, didn't mean, you know, emerging players, whatever. Um, we have a dialogue the way a human historically had that conversation. You sort of take each of the steps of the process and you break it down into what does success look like? Where is there an opportunity to automate, to make things more efficient, an opportunity to augment? And you can do more now because you're starting 50% of the way there because all the horsepower of AI got you there in seconds. And now you can take things much further. Um, but just to make it really tangible for any listeners who are thinking through, yes, you have to bring your people along and make sure there's you know understanding or support of where their almost moat as a human contributor is, but also how their actual workflow is going to evolve when they think about, you know, almost the widgets going through the assembly line and what they're, you know, taking as inputs and then eventually creating as outputs. I'm curious if you guys publish your own research. I say that because I feel like so many people trying to figure out their own workflows and trying to figure out their own, in part, their own workforce planning how are we evolving together? How are we moving people to higher level tasks? How are we only giving AI th things that we know it can confidently do, not just you know hack at <laughs> in a way? But yeah, I I'm just curious if you guys have come up with you know some novel approaches that would be relevant and beneficial to all my listeners and <laughs> and way, way beyond. The quick comment I can make is that we um, we did have a you know biweekly event series last year where we sort of took uh, attendees under the hood and showed how we were building things. Uh, we can certainly link in the comments a couple of the resources that we shared for listeners. I think in terms of groundbreaking and unique approach, we you know I, I say the team because I had no I take no credit for it, but you know thought through how do we approach moving the business into this new world and had this structure. Um, I don't know if it's materially different or, you know, shocking or insightful compared to what other companies are. We're all just kind of figuring the same thing out as we go and it worked for us. And so um, what we you know, did spend a good amount of time and continue to do is talking through, here's a process we followed, here's how we broke down our steps. And then you just need to translate that to your own workflow. And that could mean as simple as like me, when I go to create a marketing campaign, there are 15 steps that I as a human take. And are there steps within that very specific task that can get automated, augmented or whatever, or, you know, as a full, you know, research function at a fortune 500, there's a million activities and you can map that. Um, but I'll just say we can certainly link and help make it tangible. I don't know if we've published any super, super under the hood semantics, but uh, I need to feel free to keep me honest. <laughs> no, I think, you know, it's always a delicate balance of like, what's the secret sauce plus what also is widely relevant. Um, I think, you know, maybe one of the things that we definitely, I'm sure, talked about in a few of the sessions that, that we'll link is uh, this idea of prompt engineering and, right, how do we actually look at each step within the workflow and understand how successful we are at that step and not just how successful, successful we are in terms of that prompt, but how successful a different model is, right? Like our mod, like our ability to choose which model determines how high quality that is, how functional that is, right? What the speed and cost uh, sort of considerations are for that, that step of, of the process. And for us, we've seen a lot of success um, on the prompt engineering side to just do a bunch of testing to understand, okay, wait, where's Haiku amazing? Where is Claude Sonnet amazing? What's the value of GPT-40 mini? Uh, and I think that there's a lot of things in there that we probably could do even more uh, you know, publishing around that space, because I think that's probably where we have uh, a bit more experience. Before we move on, I need to let you know about my friend Mark Pfeffer and his show, People Tech. If you're looking for the latest on product development, marketing, funding, big deals happening in talent acquisition, HR, HCM, that's the show you need to listen to. Go to the Work to Find Network, search up People Tech. Mark Pfeffer, you can find him anywhere. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Victoria, you said something at the beginning that I wanted to follow up on. A lot of startups, they have kind of jumped into generative AI with, with both feet. And because of what Inesh was just talking about, like the speed at which some of the capabilities are improving, you've got this existential risk in, in a way if you can't keep up because if you're if you're just tapping in 
to some of those for, you know, specific, you know, tasks or, you know, steps in your workflow or what have you, but they're releasing at whatever frequency, you know, all these new capabilities. I mean, I've seen some young, granted they're younger than, than wonder, but I've seen some startups get disrupted. Like everything they've done for the last six months was almost, you know, the new technology, just the new release, just basically made it all available and, and threw it out there. Like what's unique and what's differentiating about what you're building. And at this point, I mean, you've got to have that right out of the, out of the gate. I mean, if you're looking for, for funding, they're going to ask you that, right? It's a great point. I, I mean, the expression I use a lot is a flick of the wrist, right? You, you, these smaller companies can be blood, sweat, and tears into solving a problem and open AI throws a cool million, forget about billions at something. And, you know, overnight they have a solution that competes. The couple of things that we, we've sort of thought about and we pushed the moat piece pretty heavily here. I actually think it does go back to the people process tool piece. Obviously we're betting on people, right? Who've not only been researchers, but we've trained them very strategically and very extensively to be executing a certain type of research very well. These are questions, you know, we just talked about the risk of hallucination and market research is a challenge because quality is really important. Even if you're just getting directional insight on the ballpark size of a new market to maybe build something in, you need to be like directionally right more than directionally wrong. So we've got the human component. We just talked about AI being a part of the tools and the technology the whole other bucket for us is IP and the process and, you know, having studied the space and knowing what, you know, good competitive intelligence looks like, um, you know, you might go to an LLM and ask for a competitive landscape. First of all, they're not going to ask you helpful questions to help really refine your ask. Are they going to go and know the right sources for you and the financial services and, you know, where your emerging players are going to exist? There's so many layers to this around what good, looks like in terms of not just the questions you ask, not just what goes into a good competitive landscape, not just the data sources, not just how to ask, access data sources that maybe you or I as an average Googler aren't going to be able to access, but that we're going to bring access to our clients. Um, I think more and more about this, I guess the two pieces here are the combination of strategic value and you know having an intersection is where moats tend to come from because someone can pick one of those things, but if they don't have both or all, then you're still at an advantage. And I think there's a bigger conversation here around there's kind of operational risk if you're choosing to buy a vendor who is great at whatever AI solution they're offering, and then they either go out of business or they release something and you've built your entire stack on integrating you know, solution V1. Right. There's a lot of risk right now because things are changing so quickly. And so that's, again, where for us, our humans and our you know experts are sort of the shock absorbers where something might change but worst case humans have been doing this research for a decade and we can still get to answers pretty damn quickly um so there's there's a, it's tricky for people and i and i say this is someone who's shopping for different tools do i trust a lot of these ai tools and that they're even going to be there in three months is it worth it to try them out now if i get used to them and they're gone so lots of complexity around this yeah i i want to just kind of take a step back and um just make sure people understand like how wonder works in terms of like the workflow and the, the human in the loop around, you know, this type of, of um, market research. So would one of you mind just kind of walking through what happens? You get a request from, from a client that, you know, this is something that I want to do a bit of research on. I'm not, I don't want to pay, you know, some big research firm to spend, you know, months and, you know, 10 people, you know, putting this together and the information I need, I think is in like all these different places. Um, and then you guys come in and say, we can do that. Yeah, yeah, definitely can walk through the, the user experience, which our focus is to figure out how do we make it as simple as possible to execute on that curiosity? Uh, because I think whenever people have that curiosity, whenever it's super complex to do, it tends not to just get asked. Uh, or you do it in a very like haphazard way. So what we wanted to do and when we thought about, okay, in this new world of AI, how do we make this experience as simple as possible? And we also landed like many others did. Uh, we landed quite early on this is like in a chat-based interface where we actually looked at all of the different um, conversations that we've actually had in chat form and also in person form 
over the past almost 10 years we've been in business to understand, okay, what does like that perfect clarification experience look like? This is over about 180 plus thousand projects that we've done. And we understood that actually it wasn't just the straight clarification process. It involved this way of thinking divergently before we actually converge on like a set of specific things that we want to tackle. That gives the person this peace of mind that, oh, wait, they covered everything that I wanted to cover and thought about things that I didn't even think of, which breeds this like form of trust that you then have without the product that you're using, regardless of whether that's human or AI. And then from there, once you understand, hey, this is now the specific things that we want to tackle, we leverage our AI to actually go out, scour the public domain, look at specific data sources. So whether that's SEC filings, whether that's data from Crunchbase, whether that's specific, you know, links that are like that outline the uh, particular company's products and services, uh, or you name it. We have 20 or so different agents that run based on the type of project uh, that we have. And then usually that takes anywhere between seconds to minutes. Then from there, we have an analyst go through and actually orchestrate between the tools based on what exists, what we actually were able to find from the AI side. And then we put that now the tools in, into the hands of the humans. And then from there, within 24 hours, we actually have that full research report for that, that customer. So ultimately, we want to make it super simple to go from that question to then what that final answer looks like and much faster and cheaper than they could go anywhere else. My last full-time role was with a small you know, boutique market research firm, specifically in the talent space. And I was there when Chat GPT was released and we just started playing around with it, even in, in that form, which was what 3.5, I think, of Chat GPT. And you could tell immediately that, I don't know, I guess I'll, me and the other market research analysts kind of looked around like, we better get our resumes together because we're not going to have to do, we're not going to need to grow the organization by adding people, but they could certainly probably take on more with less as everyone always wants to do. But now this technology seems to really be able to do it. So I guess I'm just curious, like, I know you have a lot of clients, but like, are, are a lot of them like bigger companies that don't have the in-depth investment in, in their own market research um, or is it more, you know, startups trying to enter a new market or is it just, you know, is it, uh, you know, a wide variety? Yeah, we, we focus on serving the large company use case, but we also have a bunch of inbound that come, that come in from the solopreneurs to like the, to the SMB market. Overall, the, while you could build up that expertise, it takes a lot to both build up the human expertise to then translate into the technical expertise. So you need this combination of both in order to make something like this happen in a way that then is economically feasible to actually go and invest in a build solution versus a buy solution whenever they come to us. I know, Victoria, if there's any other piece you want to add to that. Well, and maybe going back to your point as well, Bob, when you think about the potential replaceability of, of humans here, um, I think in general, any of our clients, any size, any stage, they're coming to us for pretty much one of three reasons. They don't do research or they don't ask questions to our niche's point before. It's too hard to get that answer. They just don't ask it. I go off the gut or my CEO told me to do whatever, so I do it. So you're kind of going zero to one there that we, we know we need to add some rigor and we need to be better. There's um, one to, you know, whatever, call it a hundred where we're doing it. But in our research with our own audience showed this as well. We're not doing it efficiently. We're not doing it cost effectively. It's too much time having to verify things. You sit down and I'm curious for your perspective, Bob, right? You pull up GPT. I have GPT, Claude, and Gemini open. And I have to go across all of them. And my answer is still not completed. Like I still have to verify. I still know that there's things that were missed. And, you know, that's not like we're not there yet. Not to say that in a year we won't be. Uh, but still, there's this element of like, I'm doing it, but I want to do more of it. And I also want to do it higher fidelity and higher quality. And then there's the element of great. Now I've got the thing on my desk. So what now? What then what? Right? Like taking it not just to what is the answer to the question? What do I make a decision based off of? What do I recommend to my stakeholders? And then how do we actually start thinking 10 steps ahead? Or what's the impact of this decision? And what kind of competitive moves do we make then? So we stop playing checkers and we start playing chess. And that's the world yeah. where you know, it's it's almost philosophical, like, will research go away? I don't know. Will strategic insights or strategy go away? Definitely not. So we might have right. to like, 
brush up on our skill sets, but our resume and getting laid off is a whole different beast, right? Because it's just the role that we play in, in helping to action on and bring insights into action, action and revenue and all that good stuff. Kind of seems like there's plenty of use cases for having a single, you know, interface, have a conversation with one, you know, super agent or however you want to define it. And then they act as sort of a, the general contractor to say, okay, now I know what you want and clarify that if necessary, but now I'm going to go and go find my subcontractors to execute specific, you know, sort of specialized tasks. Is that part of what you guys are doing? The Volvo XC60 plug-in hybrid is about performance, not just on the road, but in life. With not only trunk space, but room to make memories. It's electric with a backup plan where the only speed that matters is how fast you can slow down. The Volvo XC60 plug-in hybrid. Performance where it matters the most. Visit volvocars.com slash US to learn more. How do custom orders work on Kraken? Imagine I'm a music producer, dialing in my newest track. Need more bass? Crank it. Vocals not popping? Double it up. Want a bigger sound? Hit that reverb. Hard. That's custom orders on Kraken. Complete control over your crypto trades. Go to kraken.com and see what crypto can be. Not investment advice. Crypto trading involves risk of loss. Cryptocurrency services are provided to U.S. and U.S. territory customers by Payword Interactive Inc. View PWI's disclosures on kraken.com slash legal slash disclosures. 100%, right? I think that, you know, it's hard to say who's going to win the UI of it, right? Like we have a very light UI that works to get projects in, which I think will, you know, be good enough for, you know, the foreseeable future until there's like a future player whenever Siri dukes it out with Google, dukes it out with Amazon, all of those big those big guys will really focus on like, what does distribution look like? And then from there, I think it really comes down to the quality of the agents themselves. I imagine what's likely going to happen with all these big players is that they're going to now say, okay, great. We need agents that do this thing really well. Well, who's the best company that does this thing really well? Like who are the best agents that deliver that? And I think like, even as we think about it in the micro case for us, like we're making partnerships with our, our enterprise partners and we previously sold them research, but now we're looking at, okay, if they're building their own internal LLM solutions, how do we actually just make our agents available via an API call, yeah. right? And I think that we'll start to see more and more of exactly that, where you have the big, uh, the big players really duke it out on the UI mass distribution side. And then you'll have the applications that are really focused on just extreme quality and their niche get really good at that thing and focus on. Right. Okay. That the makes sense. The only other comment I'll make there to your general contractor analogy, which I really like, Bob, we think of it as sort of like a chef, right? Where you've got all these spices on the spice rack or all of these different elements and ingredients. And it goes back to your point about moat as well. The point solution where you can go to Anisha's point, to a certain company because they are the best at a certain thing and you use their agent for a certain thing. It'll be interesting to see how things fall out. Our hypothesis, at least where we're you know spending our time, we have world-class agents at certain things that will go and mine this source or you know pull this type of information and you put 10 of them together and no other company is offering that combination of 10. You're either going to have to go pay 10 different companies and add it all up, or you're going to have to supplement that with your own bandwidth and energy and cost, whatever of your own, you know, internal talent. So there's an interesting kind of unknown as we see things fall out there, but we see that in every industry always, right? Centralization and decentralization. But um, when you think about the formidable nature of like what our clients are trying to do is, are they trying to just do, you know, a quick scan of a competitor? No, they're doing that for a reason. And the more that we can help them get to wherever they're trying to go quicker through a really strong stack of, you know, contractors or spices on the spice rack or whatever, right. the more valuable we are to them because the more effective they can be in their role. I do like the cooking uh, analogies, right? Because there's a bunch of different ways to think about it as your prompts might be, you know, recipes and you've got to, you know, not everyone who uses the same ingredients, it's, it's going to, the output's not going to be the same. We've seen that in countless, you know, cooking shows where people just, you know, it was disastrous and yet they had the same exact kitchen and the same oven and the same ingredients and everything. It didn't turn out quite the same. I guess the, the other thing that it made me think about is like this whole concept of, well, part of the future of work is around thinking about how jobs sort of morph and change. And, you know, if, 
if AI takes more tasks or, or more tasks get automated, at some point you reach a threshold where it says, well, this person's job has now fundamentally changed. So let's, for argument's sake, let's just say it's, you know, 50%. Well, now you have to re redefine the scope of these different roles. And I just, again, think back to some of the market research that we did at, at IBM. I had, a, I had a whole team of people who did the actual research and then brought me back the results and we would sort of iterate back and forth until it got to something actually insightful that I could go take to my executive stakeholder and say, these are some insights that we have and here are some potential, you know, actions that you could take as, as a result, tweak this, you know, shift, shift this here, shift this budget here, you know, things like that. I mean, it was just recommendations. They didn't have to take the, the advice, but, but just the, the whole back and forth between me and another, you know, a whole team of people in another, you know, time zone and in another continent and that back and forth, you know, you've, you've basically applied AI to do a lot of that work, but I will say those were very bright people capable of doing a lot more. So I do think some of these things lead to real conversations about what do we do with these people and how can we, it's either how can we reinvest in them and, and find, you know, new roles for them as the company grows, or do we take more of a sort of myopic, you know, take the win kind of approach and let some good people go. Uh, unfortunately, I know that's not an easy business decision that some would not take very lightly, but it still doesn't make it any easier. Uh, that's something that we've mulled over for, you know, and gone in a few different, you know, directions over the past couple of years. Uh, but I think maybe the most salient one that, that has come is like, you'll never regret investing more in people. And then people will show whether they're there for it, but the people that then show that they are there for it, they more than offset those that show that they aren't and that you invested in someone that probably didn't work out. And then you have to have the tough conversations after because the people that you did invest in, they're super motivated. They're super clear. They have the historical context. They're, they're extremely adaptable for this now new world where adaptability is actually the key thing to, to select for. I've witnessed firsthand uh, that like so many of our analysts have just really taken that next step or maybe a few steps up. Uh, and it's just beautiful to see. It's beautiful to see it. I, that makes me very excited whenever new updates come out, not for, oh my God, now we have to understand how do we bring this workforce along. I get to now say, oh my God, I get to let my workforce tell me, how do we get brought along? How do we actually now leverage this thing? Which is just incredibly valuable. Yeah, I, I love to hear that. Just to jump ahead a little bit. I mean, when I think about AIQ and AI literacy and, and skills and readiness, mindset is critical, right? You really need to constantly look for opportunities for, for growth, right? And so that may not be a linear path. I mean, there's plenty of folks, including myself, who have had a non-traditional you know, career Path. There's plenty of rewarding things that you can do, and there's plenty of transferable skills that you may not even realize that you have that that you could take on, right? So you don't have to be replaced. You can choose not to be replaced by technology, but you've got to put in the effort, and and you've got to have the right mindset that says I can learn, I can grow, and to your point, I can adapt. You can have you know an open mind and a mindset and a curiosity. I think it's worth calling out. There's a very real barrier with the complexity, even what we were talking about before, that companies are either making an operational risk or an investment to say, we're going to build on this model. And that means we're riding on the coattails of this thing. Like if it changes, we got to figure out how to stay up to date. And, you know, that's like the strategy we're betting on now. I, you know, a lot of leaders that I've spoken with is we try and understand how, you know, where they stand on all of these AI components and, you know, do they care? How are they upscaling? There's a real barrier of like, I'm interested. I know it's relevant. I know I need to like learn how to use these things, but where do I start? Or, okay, I've mapped my workflow. Now there's 17 different free AI tools that help me write, write content better. Am I going to now spend a week 
investigate all these tools, learn one, maybe it's dead in a week. There's, there's, I just want to acknowledge for anyone listening, like there's a, there's a weird limbo we're in right now where you kind of just got to throw yourself into it. And LLMs at least are the simplest barrier to entry to, you know, cross over, but there is an element of getting yourself. I, I talk a lot about even for myself, right? I'm in a company where we're doing this and I know there's a lot more efficiency I can bring to my own workflow. But to me, there's a perceived barrier and there's behavior. The mindset is there, behavior is not there yet, except for in certain components, because maybe I'm just OCD with like wanting to pick the right tool, but it's like, there's so many options and there's a lot to navigate and there's so many free things. And then there's GPTs and it's like, how do I, where do I even begin? It's a very real thing that if your listeners are feeling, feeling it, at least they're not in denial about not needing the skill set to change, but uh, there, there is just real right. challenges with actually acting on it to, to empathize. <laughs> you know, if you're at a company that's starting to adopt it, obviously you should probably be a good corporate citizen and try at least try the tools that they have, you know, sanctioned to give you. But I know people are looking, you know, way beyond that and they're, they've already been playing around with things in, in their personal uh, lives and, and things like that. But no, I, I definitely appreciate that uh, situation, Victoria. I mean, I, I try to play around with, a lot of the tools. I mean, I, I would be a hypocrite if I didn't um, play around with quite a few, but it is a lot, right? Because all the tools that you you were already using now say, oh, it's you know now with AI, right? Like bolted on, and you're like, well, how do I, how much do I tr trust this? I mean, yeah, I've been using this tool, and I'd like to continue using it, but you know, I am gonna kick the tires, and I am gonna see if these new features are are reliable, but we can't. We still have to apply our own, you know, critical, you know, thinking and not, you know, it's not a calculator, at least for most of these general, you know, um, you know, LLM powered tools. But so, you, yeah, you got to figure out what's going to work in your workflow. But I think, you know, to some of the points raised earlier, sometimes they have to work together in order to really make the whole process, you know, streamlined, right? Because if, if you haven't addressed the workflow and the end to end process then it's like individual productivity when you're working as part of a team right like if you if you have one cog spinning at 10x and the others are at their original speed something's going to break right so i do think organizations need to take you know a, a careful look at and, and certainly move beyond productivity individual productivity and start thinking about other metrics and start thinking about where the real value is is generated right like when you if you do save, you know, X amount of man hours or, uh, you know, person hours in the week, how are, how might you be reinvesting, you know, some of that? And it goes back to what we talked about before about potential, you know, job displacement is right. Like that you have a choice. You can reinvest some of the cost avoidance, cost savings in the people that got you to where you are and the people that are going to help you execute your strategy going forward. And, and as well as in more technology um, and find more use cases around the company, or you can just take, you know, take the win and, and just say, well, we don't need those, those people anymore. Hopefully a lot more companies choose the former and not the latter, but, you know, we know not everyone's behavior is altruistic and human centric, unfortunately. So, yeah, so that's, that's a big piece of it. But one of the other thoughts I had, Victoria was, you're talking about all these people just trying to figure out where to go and they're going off on these goose chases looking you know trying different tools and more traditional research methods or whatever you know at bigger companies you guys may have experienced this already but when you go through your annual planning exercise you know you're trying to encompass a lot across people process technology data and you broke up them into all these sub teams and then everyone went off and did a little piece of the research and then it only came together back together in like a you know at the final stages to, to piece it all together which i th thought that's a lot of man hours that went in to putting this together and that could be streamlined by going to see you guys but also to not put those insights together until the end your insights are going to be limited because you didn't put more potentially interconnected sort of pieces of the broader puzzle together sooner and say, well, how, how do these things impact each other? So I think that is a miss taking these traditional 
approaches and it seems like in theory you know wonder would you know mitigate that that risk yeah it definitely does there's a few pieces that i think clients have found to be especially valuable here um there's generally most companies have an appreciation that starting with like what exists in the first place which is like step zero before what you just described bob like what do we what have we just conducted research on did someone just do a trends report is there data that we can mine from our product or whatever or is there stuff publicly available that even a competitor published let alone even gartner or bcg or whoever there's stuff out there that we can at least start somewhere and not at zero and then like find the same things out <laughs> and we you know have wasted time and effort and money just to get to like basically what was already out there um and then kind of within that there's the efficiency piece so that's where you know ai becomes really powerful because if you can get all of that together we use the language collecting the dots so that you can more quickly get to the connecting the dot stage and that's either you know, Bob, I imagine there was value in the different perspectives, the different teams brought to whatever they were doing. Was it necessary that they each had to roll up their sleeves and apply their manpower? No, but they did. We did want all those perspectives to come together and create a stronger fiber for wherever the strategy went or the you know vision went. But then, you know, you, you have to just kind of think in general with like where the insights that you're trying to accumulate, does it make sense to um, have one of these big one-off efforts. We have seen our clients be very quick to adopt. You know, the mindset that we advocate for is there's big projects. Sure, you're going to have this planning effort. There's ongoing monitoring that keeps you smart over time. And then there's little questions that'll pop up over time. And if all you ever do is sit down once a year or once a quarter and really stick your head in his hand and learn all the things that you can, starting from zero instead of halfway there, using all your manual labor instead of AI, you're so much farther behind your competitors who are, again, using AI or staying always on. They're monitoring things. They've got, you know, all these different cadences of insights coming to them. And then they can throw half of it out in the trash. That's fine. But at least they're getting exposure to them um, and, you know, able to pluck or pluck from a better crop of options or insights or data or signals instead of like, we just had this one week. We all went heads down. They came up with 50% of the same things that we came up with. You know, there, there's so I'm being dramatic, obviously, but there's a lot of room for efficiency. But just again, that curiosity of culture, or that culture of curiosity becomes way easier to act on when some of the tools get out of the way, but also make it way easier for you to bite on it. Yeah, no, culture of curiosity. I love it. When I think about the way that you're actually leveraging the, the humans in, in the process, one of the things that came to mind was around, it's not just that you need human, you know, intuition and someone to make sure the context is right and make sure, you know, it's to mull, you know, output, especially when it's combined from different, you know, AI models. But I think about cognitive diversity and making sure that you've also looked at potential, you know, bias in the output, or even as you're putting a final report together, just making sure that you've incorporated different perspectives, whether that's, you know, academic background, cultural background, geographic backgrounds, things like that. And which sometimes, at least to date, I don't know that some of the AI output necessarily has those sensitivities. So I was curious if any, any thoughts on that angle? Yeah, I think when we this kind of goes back to the history of wonder. Uh, we have strayed away over, you know, over our time from being that like subjective, like here's the recommendation, here's all of these other things um, that tend to lead to the bias of the person actually doing the work. And have always leaned towards here's objectively what we found at this source, right? If you believe this source, then you also believe the data point that comes from that source. We have our own sort of master resource list that effectively says, hey, here are great sources, here are bad sources, here is sort of the scoring between them. And we've taken a lot of those learnings and put that into our AI solution as well to figure out, okay, well, now how do we effectively score sources in a way that, that allows us to prioritize the, the most trustworthy, most unbiased ones? Now, is there bias regardless? There always is, right? I think that like, it's very tough to eliminate every source of bias, especially whenever any human touches the work, we try to create the, the right framework to remove that such that it is as objective as possible. 
And that whenever there's like, you know, sort of another way to think about it is like, what tools do you even use, right? Like when we think about like cognitive, cognitive diversity, like the AI chooses its own tools based on, you know, sort of how, however the AI decides to choose the tools that it uses. But the human may choose very different tools and a different human may choose very different tools. So like, how do we think about cognitive diversity in actual tool selection? Uh, it's actually one of the topics that me and the team have talked about actually earlier this week was, well, the AI will choose those tools. That doesn't mean that we need to cho- choose those exact same tools on the human side. It's actually better if we don't and we think about things um, separately as though a human were tackling this problem, leveraging the AI horsepower. Nice. Okay. So we all are playing around with, with tools at work, at home. Uh, I was curious if you guys have any favorite tools that you use outside of, outside of work that you have found particularly cool or insightful, you know, not necessarily have to name the, the specific, you know, um, model or, or program. Just curious, like how, like use, use case wise, like how you're using it. I mean, I'll say that my use of the tools is as much what I said before, knowing I need to learn how to use them as very academic, right? I'm like monitoring all of the different types of tools that could be used for desk research and using them to see where they're flawed relative to wonder. So uh, a lot of it is like sometimes it's research or if I'm investigating, again, different tools we might want to use for XYZ or audience insight tools. So, you know, my marketing and content strategy or whatever, um, I'm, I'm working across multiple at a time, usually just to see how they compare and um, sort of the, the front end version of what Inesh was describing, whereas certain, you know, this model of that versus this model of that, I'm thinking of like the UI here feels better and results here feel better. So yeah, that, that's pretty much what it's been for me. Other than that, a lot of what I've seen with the tools that we already use is they will slap on an AI, you know, lipstick on a pig element where like, do I need Notion to summarize yeah. the thing that I purposely just pull it out, out a bunch of points to make it not a watered down sentence? No, but I appreciate the effort. So <laughs> that's where I stand. <laughs> yeah, cool. And Ish, what about you? Yeah, I think on, on my end, one of the pet projects that, uh, that I'm working on is a bedtime podcast in Spanish. Uh, so like one that we can actually like use AI to say, hey, this is like this like story in Spanish because I'm learning Spanish right now. And I want to see if there's any way that I can like incorporate that into my routine. So just partnering with ChatGPT to create different sections and chapters. So you can imagine, right, like it can't create like a whole novel, right? Because the token context is just way too short for something that complex. But especially with the newest models, right, the, the ability to go a little bit more multimodal, uh, I think that there's a lot of fun opportunities there on the personal side. On the professional side, I use ChatGPT multiple times a week, um, not just for research. I love having ChatGPT there. It's just a sounding board um, and just ways to sort of just tighten up any copy that if I'm, if I'm just like, I either am lazy to fix this, fix this or I've like, I've like beat my head against the wall. I'm like figuring out how do I like make this as concise as possible. Then, then uh, ChatGPT is sort of, sort of my go-to there. Uh, and then on the image side, right? I think that there's a lot of really cool stuff that Dolly does. Uh, there's also a lot of frustrating stuff, honestly, that Dolly does. Like the whole editing process with Dolly, like you've gotten me like really close to it, but because you haven't gotten me all the way there, I actually have to just redo this whole thing. But uh, but it's fun. It's really cool to see what what it can do. Yeah, I had the same frustrating experience. Well, it all really stemmed from trying to get it to include words in the image so i suppose it'll get better it might have to take a different approach to get better but yeah it was so so yep. close it was like 98 percent, and it's like nope you can't just misspell words right and i don't know how many times i can try to explain it just put these letters one right after the, the other and whatever so yeah no it's um they will get better i mean i'm not creative so i definitely went in there to look at you know podcast logos and company logos and stuff like that to see what it could do but yeah it got a little over complex and then and then everyone else was doing it so i was like oh, okay maybe i don't want to just hack something together that looks like everyone else's cool colorful images so yeah it'll it'll definitely get better but um i do have an appreciation for people that are really creative and designers or whatever because they do great work and it's worth it <laughs> 
I know we, we kind of hit on this uh, a little bit before, but I just thought, you know, in closing, if you had any other thoughts around how people can get started if they haven't gotten started to just be, be comfortable and literate uh, when it comes to, to AI, like what do you, what advice would you give for someone that wanted to elevate their AIQ? My own experience, I'll channel with saying the two pieces are first they the lowest lowest barrier to entry tool to try and just experiment using is your LLM. So any of them, all of them, I mean, I've used it for ideas for cooking, just whatever. You know, you have a question instead of going to Google, just like get familiar and then you also learn right? This is the challenge for a lot of people. You learn where it's not helpful. You learn what you should have asked or you should have provided this context. That's okay. But at least you're like also thinking about thinking and there's you know value in that. Um, and then the other second piece is if there's some like very micro piece of your day that you feel is very monotonous or you, you know, think that there must be a tool for it, just pick one and like, you know, figure out how you can test and it. And again, there's an element of like being observant of where it falls short and where it is or isn't helping. But I think there's just bite off a little piece. And that's the best, the best first step versus feeling like I have to redo my whole workflow and my resume while I'm at it. (laughs) hundred percent agree with all of that. I think on the professional side, still treat it like an intern, you know, you might have to redo a lot of that work, but it's an intern that could grow into some, into something that like is actually like a really well contributing knowledge worker on your team. And uh, I think, going into it with that level of like openness and kindness to it also like then lets you not have as you know high high of expectations uh for it but also it allows you just to play like you can give an intern sort of that small task and they probably will be you know solid at it and then on the personal side i'd probably say yeah just anytime you have a question anytime you like want to talk to someone about this new thing that you're doing like, especially I think the new stuff it's like really good at, I think those are really helpful times to just like pop open chat GPT and, and just ask it something. Uh, on the engineering side, there's a lot, actually a lot of ton of, there's a ton of use cases. I think we're seeing a lot of great use cases from Claude. Uh, our engineers almost exclusively now use Claude instead of chat GPT. Uh, it's helping eliminate a lot of boilerplate code. So for all the engineers listening, uh, highly recommend checking that out. Excellent. All right. Um, well, this was a great, great, insightful conversation. Thank you guys so much for being here, Victoria, Anish. Uh, this was great. Um, I will make sure to get links from you, include those in the show notes for this episode. And um, anyway, yeah, thank you again for, for being here. Happy to be here. Thanks again for the time. Feel free to reach out to us. On, I think we're both on LinkedIn. So if anybody has questions or want to chat through how you're thinking about things, we're always happy to engage. Perfect. All right, guys. Thank you again. Um, Thank you, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time.